special guest from Ireland. Dr. Pat Walsh will speak on the topic of forgotten aspects of the Greek War on Turkey, 1916-1922. In August, we celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Battle of Sakarya, the most critical battle of the Turkish War of Independence. This month, we'll celebrate the 99th anniversary of the liberation of Izmir. This victory effectively completed the four-year epic struggle of the Turkish forces led by Mustafa Kemal to clear Anatolian homeland from the occupying Greeks, British, French, Italians, and Armenians. Dr. Walsh will cover many aspects of the Greek war, which were and are still kept from the public eye quite skillfully by the British propaganda machine and the obliging Greeks. Dr. Patrick Walsh is a historian, political analyst, and teacher. He has written a number of books about the 1890-1920 period with particular interests in British foreign policy, the First World War, Germany, Ottoman Turkey, Russia, Armenia, and Azerbaijan. His latest publication was Great Britain Against Russia in the Caucasus. And this year, he published a number of articles on the Second Karabakh War, reflecting the current situation. He, has, he also has a book published on Irish history and the conflict in Northern Ireland. Dr. Walsh received his PhD from Queen's University, Belfast, Department of Political Science, bachelor's with honors from University of London in Geography and History. His website, drpatwalsh.com, provides a wealth of academic research on the recent and current history and geopolitics of Eurasia. His well-researched articles and books present a refreshingly different view from the many well-worn and repetitive European and American accounts. We would like to thank Dr. Walsh taking the time from his biggest busy schedule for our program. I'd also like to thank our Task TV team, Erdal Shahin, Bülent Büyükgezici, Altar Gültekin, and Geçmiş Olsun to Ezgi Esen. Before we start, I would like to take one minute, as we do every week, and report on the progress of the record-breaking Turkish sportsman Erdan Eruç, rowing solo in the middle of the Pacific as we speak. Erdan holds 15 Guinness World Records and is just on the way to few more. He left California 72 days ago, rode 2300 20, miles, now is near Hawaii. After Hawaii, he's rowing solo to Hong Kong, which is approximately 5600 miles more. That is traveling with oars only, no motors, no emissions, no carbon footprint. Our hearts and minds are with air then, and we'll keep you updated every week. Yes, Dr. Walsh, the podium is yours. Um, thank you very much, Aya. Um, you know, it's a pleasure to speak to you on these really important anniversaries for Turkey. And, um, you know, it really is a pleasure to, to, to talk about these subjects. Um, could I have the first slide, please? OK, that's great. Um, I'm looking at my monitor over here as well, because uh, just I can my eyesight is unfortunately not good enough for this, but uh, I can see it. No problem. So first of all, let me talk about, you know, how I started writing about this uh, issue, really. Um, about, I think 12 years ago, I wrote a book called Britain's Great War on Turkey. And actually, the most of the information that I'm going to talk about this afternoon is really from that book. 
That book was really to try to look at the war that uh, Britain waged on the Ottoman Empire um, in a complete way. In other words, to look at all the aspects of it that really had been forgotten in the West. So it took into sort of issues like, you know, why the war had been waged on the Ottoman Empire and, and what were the outcomes of this war. So I looked at issues like um, uh, Palestine, like Mesopotamia, like, um, you know, Iraq, obviously, like, um, you know, gr and the Greek involvement in this war. And the Greek involvement, I think, composed about three chapters of this. So most of the information I I'm going to talk about this afternoon you know, I researched about 15 or so years ago, and it was almost entirely looked at through the prism of British foreign policy. I tried to put myself through, um, you know, actually into the shoes of these people, these great statesmen, people like Lloyd George, like Sir Edward Grey, like Winston Churchill, um, uh, like Arthur Balfour. These people are really determined what was going on in the world at that critical point that really ma made the 20th century uh, what it was. And so I looked at, I read, I obviously went to the archives and I read loads of um, imperialist, uh, imperial uh, writings, books, uh, periodicals. Um, and I tried to put together a narrative that would explain, understand what was happening. Because I, w I was discontent with the, uh, the production of, 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 you know, sort of like, you know, history books and, and academics uh, who seemed to be skirting around the issues and didn't really seem to grasp them because they weren't completing a, a full, uh, uh, producing a full story. And that's what I was discontent. So I wanted to transport myself back to the time and actually to try to look at the thing from that forgotten world that existed prior to the First World War and uh, during the First World War. The, the second book on the Armenians I wrote really doesn't touch too much on this. But the third, I think, um, one does uh, about the Caucasus, because I'm going to talk about briefly about how the Caucasus has an impact in this um, issue, because it's basically been ignored by, um, by historians, uh, the implications of the Caucasus front uh, in the Greek war. And I think it is important because it, it has a, a very uh, important insight about the relationship between Britain and the Greeks that is missed by people who study this subject entirely on the sort of Western uh, front of, of Turkey, so to speak. So I'm going to briefly talk about that um, later on. OK, could I have the next slide, please? OK, in, in summary, then, um, I'd like to say this, that the Greeks versus the Turks is only a small part of this overall story. And, you know, it's understandable that, you know, um, that it's looked like it's looked at like this by by a lot of people, you know, Greeks and maybe some Turks as well, who see it as a you know a fundamentally a war between two people. But really, you know, this this struggle would not have taken place if it hadn't been part of a, a wider global catastrophe that started in 1914 and you know came to an end in 1922, but probably you know 23 as well. But essentially. You know, what we have to say is that catastrophe was the most important element in this story. Um, and why I bring that up is essentially this, because there possibly could have been a war between the Greeks and the Turks if there hadn't been a great, the First World War. But if there had been, it would have been a completely different war. It wouldn't have been anything as catastrophic as this war. But because the conflict between Greeks and Turks occurred within a much wider and catastrophic event, it became the event it became. You know, in other words, the implications of this event, the consequences of this event, you know, the destruction of really essentially, you know, the Greek community of Anatolia, the destruction, you know, obviously the population exchanges between Turks and Greeks at the end of the war, all these things here, the Armenian situation, these things wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the First World War. They would have, there would have been different events. So this has to be borne in mind all the time. The Greeks are essentially are what was known as a cat's paw, the paw of a cat, the, 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 the hand of a cat in those days. Today, that, that word is usually used, is called a proxy. They, they, they acted as a proxy of, of British imperialism and, and of other forms of imperialism as well, but primarily British imperialism. So they have, the Greek participation in the war has to be understood in that way. 
that is not to say that um, the, the British just used them as an instrument. They were also a willing instrument because possibly around about 40 percent, 50 percent of the Greek population were willing to involve themselves in this this adventure or misadventure, as it turned out. And I'm going to go into that later on. But, you know, we have to see it as a sort of a, we have to see their role as a two way thing, basically as them, them being a, an instrument of British imperialism and also as being a willing instrument of British imperialism uh, uh, from a, the point of view of us of a part of the Greek population. OK, um, the Greek this this is very important because the Greek fortunes in this war are highly dependent on the on their sponsor, which is Britain and British interests. So can if they can win the war, it's, it's very much determined by what Britain does for them and, and how much Britain is prepared to back them and how much it's prepared to see them as part of their interests at any particular time. So that has to be understood as well. And ultimately, the Greeks lose uh, partly because, uh, obviously, uh, and primarily because the Turkish resistance is put up against them. But secondly, because of the fact that they don't get the backing that they require at crucial moments. And so that has to be borne in mind. And lastly, the final result of the, the Greek war on, on the Turks um, is actually an outcome of what I call Britain's Pyrrhic victory in the Great War. Now, the, the word Pyrrhic is actually a Greek word, you know, um, and essentially, you know, the British, have, it's very strong in, in British classical education, the idea of a Pyrrhic victory, a victory that seems to be um, a victory, but is actually a defeat in some ways. Not maybe a defeat, but essentially a victory that weakens you so much that you are, you know, you are, you are fundamentally weakened to the extent that the victory is not worth it. And why I'm talking about a Pyrrhic victory is because this is essentially what Britain won in the First World War, a Pyrrhic victory. It was the turning point of British power in the world. You know, from there on, the British power seeps away and the Americans take over their role, essentially, for the rest of the 20th century. It's a slow process, but it happens. And it happens as a result of the First World War because Britain takes on a conflict that thinks it can... Uh, only engage in in a minor way, or maybe not a major, or not 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 the, to the extent that it thought it was going to be, but it gets damaged so much by this conflict. And the Greek uh, war on Turkey is is a really big um, incidence in this process uh, of, uh, of of a pyrrhic victory for Britain. Okay, could you turn to the next slide, please? OK, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to look at some quotations to base this round rather than just give a big, long narrative about it. Let's have a look at some interesting quotations uh, that, that will take us through the course of this conflict. And the first one really is from uh, a man called Basil Thompson, who was a, a British intelligence um, operator, very se uh, senior in British intelligence. And he worked in Greece and he was later in charge of Scotland Yard, the sort of British police in London. Um, now, he describes the the political situation in Greece at the start of the European war in this way. He says, Greece was in a state of internal peace, which had been rare in our history. In 1913, she had emerged victorious from two consecutive Balkan wars in which her king, that's King Constantine, had led her so successfully in the field that our territory had been gradually greatly enlarged, actually had been doubled. But our people were war weary. And since the quarrel between Austria and Serbia, seemed in no way to concern them. Their feeling was for a neutrality, benevolent toward England and France. So what we have to think about first, and, and people may not realize this, is that the majority of the Greek population and their king and their chief of star, staff, General Matakas, you know, they basically didn't want to get involved in the, in the Great War at all. Uh, either in the Balkans, you know, in, in support of Serbia against the Austro-Hungarians or against the Ottoman Empire. I mean, fundamentally, there was a majority in Greece against participation in the war. And, you know, Greece was not really um, in a good situation to wage this war. So that really has to be borne in mind at the very beginning before we, 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 we go any further, you know, in case we get the, the mistaken impression that the Greeks are just waiting to jump into Antolia Anatolia and, and conquer the area and take it for Greece. It, that wasn't really the truth of the matter. 
There was people like this, and we're going to meet them in a minute. But uh, essentially, Greece is very divided and is probably um, majority, almost certainly, against participation in this catastrophic war that is developing in August uh, 1914. So could I have the next slide, please? So we have a really what, a big division in Greece. And um, there's a very good book by a, a man called George Abbott. Uh, he's a, a, an English author as well. Oh, my, nearly all of my, sport, my sources will be British. They're not going to be Turkish against the Greeks or, or Greeks against Turks. They're going to be British sources and they're going to be interesting sources, but sources that you don't see um, essentially in mainstream accounts because they, are, uh, they, they, they spoil the narrative. They spoil the narrative that's been constructed about the Great War that is essentially a false narrative, but it's, it's, it's a propagandist narrative. And uh, there are still historians engaging in this propagandist narr narrative to this day. Um, of course, academics, you know, are paid by states and they, they work for state institutions. So they, they continue with this vein. But anyway, here's the an estimation that was written by George Abbott in, uh, I think it was around about nine, uh, 1922 he wrote this. And he said, and he describes exactly the conflict that, that emerged in Greece at this time. This is in 1914, 1915. He said, King Constantine, a practical soldier, estimated that the European war would be of long duration and doubtful issue. In this battle of giants, he saw no profit for pygmy, pygmies like Greece, but only perils. At the same time, he did not forget that Greece had in Bulgaria and Turkey two embittered enemies who would most probably try to fish in troubled waters. Obviously, these were people, you know, both, both Bulgaria and Turkey were annoyed after the, 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 the Balkan Wars. If they did so, he was prepared to fight, but to fight with a definite objective and on a definite military plan, which took into account the elements of time, place and resources. The king's standpoint was shared by most Greece, Greek statesmen and soldiers of note. They all, in varying degrees, stood for neutrality, with possible intervention on the side of the Entente at some favourable moment, but it did not command itself to its to his premier. Caution was a foreign thing to um, Venezuela's ambition and adventurous temperament. Military considerations had little meaning for his civilian mind. Taking the speedy victory of the Entente as a foregone conclusion, and imbued with a sort of mystical faith in his own prophetic insight and star, he looked upon the European war as an occasion for imperialist aggrandizement, which he felt Greece ought to grasp without an instant's delay. So Venizelos, his attitude was, we cannot miss the bus in Athens. This is our great opportunity to expand our territory and to get something in Anatolia, maybe even to, to get hold of Constantinople, Istanbul, but also Thrace, you know, areas like this, some of the islands off the, off, off the Turkish coast. So this is what he thought, we won't want to miss out on this great opportunity. We, you know, the big battalions are on our side, the British, the French, uh, they are, they're, they're going to smash the Turks very quickly. Uh, uh, so that we want to be in there and we're going to get our rewards if we help. So that's what his viewpoint. On the other view, on the other side, King Constantine realized that this was a very risky venture. And his chief of staff, Metakis, has done had done his uh, homework. He he'd surveyed the possibility of a mil military uh, expedition to Anatolia in the past during the Bal Balkan Wars. And he decided this was just beyond the Greek army. And he also, he had a great opinion of the Greeks around uh, Smyrna. He thought they were like a quite a, you know, they were basically a, a, like a, a bourgeoisie, a type of, um, you know, gen not gentle, but a, a townspeople that wouldn't be, wouldn't be up to fighting rugged Turkish peasants if it came to the bit. So, you know, uh, he, he, he thought this was a bad venture. So this was the big division that you got in, in Greece in 1914, 1915. It was a highly divided society. Can I have the next slide, please? So what, what essentially happens, um, waiting for it to change now. Um, I've got it up here now. Oh, there it is, yeah. So what essentially happens is Britain um, initially 
Venizelos asks Britain, can he participate in the war? He's the British Prime Minister, and he's actually engaging in secret diplomacy with Britain um, behind the back of his king. And the, the system in, in, in Greece is that the king is, is in charge of foreign policy. And so Venizelos is actually going against the Greek constitution in this. And so he's making approaches to the British and saying, if we do something for you, can we can we get involved in this war can, um, 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 and you can reward us type of thing? So he's doing this. Uh, the British are looking at him first and they're saying, we don't want the Greeks involved in this venture in 1914, 1915. This is before the Gallipoli landings, of uh, Gallipoli attack. But why? And, and the main reason is Sir Edward Grey, the British Foreign Minister, he's obviously in alliance and he's carefully put together an alliance with Tsarist Russia. And Tsarist Russia is looking to take Constantinople or Istanbul. And essentially, he hasn't promised uh, the city to the Russians at this point. He does do in 1915. But he's, he's basically leading the Tsar to believe that he's going to take the city. And he's going to have the city after the war. So obviously he doesn't want the Greeks interfering with this. And, and so he's, he's careful. And the Greeks, uh, Venizelos wants to take part in Gallipoli, but uh, the British say, no, we don't want you uh, involved in this operation. So the initial period before what happens in Gallipoli and the Dardanelles, the, the British are not keen on the Greeks. But as things get, uh, as, the, as the Dardanelles expedition goes wrong, and the British get bogged down in Gallipoli, things change. Um, so what happens is the British decide to uh, maybe enlist the, the Greeks. Now, there's different viewpoints in Britain, and one of the viewpoints is that the Greeks should be uh, coerced into actually, you know, away from their neutrality. They should actually be almost made to fight, uh, always bearing in mind that there is a section of Greek population that actually does want to fight. Um, and does want to involve itself in this adventure in the First World War. But um, so what they do is, after their initial reluctance, they start uh, putting pressure on Greek, the Greeks, and particularly King Constantine, because King Constantine wants to remain neutral, and he is determined to remain neutral. His policy is benevolent neutrality, in other words, friendly neutrality to the British. Now, so what happens is, uh, um, Edward Grey, the British Foreign Minister, has, has a dilemma. Um, he has to introduce a policy of non-coercive coercion. So, you know, for a number of reasons. One is that he doesn't want to... Uh, the war is a moral, uh, a moral thing for Britain. It, 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 they're declaring that the Germans are the bad guys. And in fact, when the Turks have joined, they're the bad guys as well. They're the, they're, it's basically the, the, the moral propaganda is civilization against the barbarians, right? And that the barbarians in the West are the Germans, and the barbarians in the East are the Turks, okay? And essentially, if you, and also Belgium was the main cause of Britain entering the war, and that was the German um, basically um, undermining Belgium's neutrality. That was the story for, for, for Britain entering the war. It's, it's a complicated story, and it's, it's not entirely true, but uh, anyway, but that was the thing that was trumpeted to the world. So essentially what happens is, you know, Britain cannot interfere with Greek neutrality openly because it looks very, very bad. So what they do is a thing called the Pacific blockade. Now, that doesn't mean the Pacific Ocean. It means a sort of a blockade by the Royal Navy on Greece that influences them, that tries to twist their arm, that tries to get them involved. You know, it basically says to the Greeks, you know, look, look at the influence we have on you. We can do all sorts of very bad things to you with our navy, because you are, after all, a, a country that's surrounded by water, and we have a very powerful navy, so we can do things to you. So they institute a thing called a Pacific blockade. Now, a lot of people say this is war, essentially, a Pacific blockade. And in fact, Balfour, who is actually at the Admiralty, the British Admiralty, he described the Pacific blockade as a, um, an act of war in 1902, when it was used by the Royal Navy in the past by various, against various powers. But it's essentially a, a sort of like a, a extreme pressure. Now, that works uh, to an extent, and the Greeks uh, are, are, are worn a bit down by it. But after that, 
they go into uh, when uh, really at the end of 1915, early 1916, the problem arises that um, things are going very, very badly in the war for Britain. It, the, the, the war has become a, like a war of attrition in the West. The Gallipoli land, landings have proved a disaster um, and various other sort of things are, are not good. So they decide that they really do need the Greeks' help. They need Greek bodies, particularly in favour of Serbia and against the Austro-Hungarians. They need to be able to expand the war. They need to be able to use neutrals rather than bring in conscription in Britain. Believe it or not, Britain is still not conscripting its own people because the liberals don't like to do that. And um, essentially, so the Greeks are seen as a sort of like a, a source of manpower in, in, in the Balkan area that will shore up the lines against the Austro-Hungarians and Germans and to an extent against the Turks, but mainly to sort of support Serbia. So what do they do? They do a number of things. They introduce a full blockade, the British. Uh, they attempt uh, an occupation of Athens, where they actually invade Athens with uh, hundreds of soldiers, French mainly. Uh, there's a big battle in Athens, which the Greeks managed to repel the, the, the Allied forces. And there's about 100 or so, 200 French and British killed. So this is a serious thing. They, uh, they land an Allied army at Salonika, okay? And then um, they actually establish a, a, a rival Greek government under Venizelos, who's, who is basically, who sort of refuses to fight an election and goes off to Crete. And then he goes to Salonika and he becomes a type of um, an alternative uh, Greek government that declares war on, on behalf of, of Greece. Uh, actually, while his king is maintaining a policy of neutrality. And they also then even seize the Greek wheat crop. And that puts uh, the Greeks under a starvation blockade. And then finally, there's a, a threats of, of flattening Athens with the Royal Navy's guns. So, you know, similarly to what they did later on, uh, you know, to uh, Istanbul, uh, they sail the Royal Navy up to Athens. And of course, the guns are trained on uh, on Athens. So all these are real, a real problem. And in the end, King Constantine actually concedes in June 1917 to save his people and he abdicates. And, um, you know, this is not a popular abdication. I mean, the Greeks are, are, are appalled at this. The majority of Greeks are actually uh, opposed to what's happened. So essentially, this is the way that the British managed to get the Greeks into the war. So entirely illegitimate, uh, but it's well worth bearing in mind. So can we have the next slide, please? So essentially, you know, the Greeks join the war late and uh, they, they, they have some participation in it, uh, mainly in the Balkans. Uh, but um, essentially, then they come to Versailles in 1919. This is the second phase, really, of, of, of the war. And um, the Greek claims at Versailles. Well, the Greeks go to the, the Versailles conference in Paris and they claim their reward for joining the war in the last year or so, a year and a half or so. And um, so they, 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 they remind uh, the British that they have actually promised them uh, territory in Europe and Asia Minor. Now, Lord Grey, uh, Sir Edward Grey, who is no longer foreign minister, he made very vague claims to the Greeks. He said he, he didn't define the territory they were going to get. He said, you know, they would get territory in, in Asia Minor is what they obviously call Anatolia and, uh, and in Europe, meaning Thrace, possibly, you know. And um, so they made promises, but the British were very careful, just like in Palestine. They were careful that they didn't nail down the promises. They were always suggested. They were always like inferred, but they were never actually said. So uh, this is a, a quotation from uh, Ar Arnold, um, Arnold Toynbee, right? So he said that at the, at the Paris conference, Mr. Venezelos, on behalf of Greece, put forward startling demands. He asked for the whole of Western and Eastern Thrace, um, up to the Black Sea, and the, the, the Chachalja lines, and for the entire Vilayet or province of Edan in Western Anatolia, with the exception of one Sanjak or department of Denizli. Okay? But with the addition of a corridor to the south coast of uh, the Marmara. The first claim meant interposing a continuous belt of Greek territory between Turkey and the other European states and between Bulgaria and the Aegean. 
The second meant taking from Turkey the richest province and principal part of Anatolia, bringing a large population under Greek rule, and leaving the two nations with these new seeds of discord sown between them to face one another along an immense land frontier. So Arnold Toynbee was essentially saying, and this was written around 1922, he was saying, you know, these Greeks are a greedy lot of people. They, they wanted more than they should have got. Now, of course, the Greeks didn't see it like this. They saw, or Venizelos didn't see it like this. He, he thought he'd been promised, and he was trying to get the maximum he was, he was promised. So uh, this is a sort of like, um, this is the first sign of problems between the Greeks and, 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 and the British. Uh, and it's, it's replicated everywhere. Essentially, you know, everybody, the British have made multiple promises to lots of people. They've made promises to the Italians. They made promises to the French, the Italians to get into the war, uh, the Greeks. They've made promises to Arabs. They've made promises to the Jews to sell a, you know, a, a home for the Jews. But at the same time, they've divided up, uh, you know, the whole of uh, this area between themselves and other imperialists. So there's lots of conflicting promises being made essentially to win the war. And the British attitude was, this war is like a really high stakes gamble. And we have to do everything to win this war. So we will promise people the earth and then we'll worry about the problem at the end of it. Because if we win it, we won't really care. So this is exactly what they did with the Greeks. But this is where the chickens come home to roost, as they say here. I don't think you have that impression in that, that expression in America or whatever, but the chickens come home to roost. So in other words, all the eggs are going to be hatched. And um, essentially, this is the first sign of problems. OK, so could I have the next slide, please? OK, so we're back to Basil Thompson of British Intelligence. So he notes that um, he, he, he notes this as well. He's commenting on this as well in his book, The Allied Secret Service in Greece. And he's saying the armistice brought a rude awakening to that most versatile statesman, King Constantine, um, to that most versatile statesman. So he's saying, you know, Venizelos has got a rude awakening. He's like, he's got a bit of a shock that the, the British are not quite as uh, amenable to his, what he wants after the war as they were during the war. But King Constantine had stipulated conditions if his country were to join the Allies, but Venizelos had joined them without any conditions. So in the peace conference, he was to learn, Venizelos was to learn a fact he ought to have known from past history that the victors in a great war are realists before all else and have no room for sentimental attachments to their small allies. The Greek army was almost intact and Isolos believed he could use it for bargaining purposes. He offered an army corps to join the ill-considered Ill allied expect ex expedition against the Bolsheviks in the Ukraine and the allied expedition failed. The Greek contingent was decimated and the Bolsheviks wreaked vengeance upon the Greek colony in southern Russia, which numbered about 100,000 people. Now, this is often forgotten that Venizelos, when he saw the situation at Paris, he thought, they're not going to give me what I wanted, so I'm going to have to offer them more. And he, what he did offer them was his army of Greeks. You know, they hadn't really been doing much fighting in the actual war. So he offered them first to the Allies, and the Allies took them and said, thank you very much. We'll use them to fight the Bolsheviks, right, in a new war. And, you know, essentially that led to the destruction of the Greek colony uh, in southern Russia. So, you know, now that, that has an implication later on because the Bolsheviks remember this. And, of course, we know that the Bolsheviks make an alliance with Mustafa Kemal. And, of course, they're thinking these Greeks, you know, they are, they're agents of the imperialists. So, you know, we're going to make sure that we support the Turks against them. So th this is a thing that's always forgotten about the Greek expedition as part of the allies against, the, against Russia. So obviously it comes back to haunt the, the Greeks later on. OK, so uh, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. And, that, and the next slide is actually just a map of, you know, this is the typical the Megali idea, the great idea, the spread of Greece into, um, into Anatolia. And this was what... Uh, Venizelos envisaged as the sort of like the great, uh, you know, the great, um, the new Byzantium, I think it was phrased as. Um, there's an interesting thing about Istanbul, really. I mean, the Greeks, I think Venizelos sort of knew he couldn't get Constantinople, Istanbul. He knew it would probably be a, like an, 
at the best there would be an international city, but he hoped that maybe it would fall into Greek hands. And he was also, uh, you know, he was, uh, the other thing we must remember is that Russian power has collapsed at this point in the sense that the, the, you know, Istanbul, Constantinople was promised to the Tsar in 1915, but the Russians have collapsed in fighting the war. And the Bolsheviks have ripped up that agreement. They've said, no, no, we have no interest in Istanbul, Constantinople. Um, you know, so essentially, you know, he, he's thinking to himself, well, who's going to get it if Russia's not going to get it? The Greeks are going to get it if anybody gets it. You know, so you can see on the map, this is the extensive claims of Greece, um, you know, that were put forward at, um, at Versailles and uh, the Magali idea, which, of course, is fatal at the end of the day. OK, so the next slide, please. So a very important thing about this, and I, I heard, you know, Professor uh, Erickson talking about this, you know, and obviously he did a, a really good a military analysis of the whole war of independence with you uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, uh, he touched on the geopolitics of it and particularly Lloyd George. And I thought, you know, we need to go into Lloyd George a bit deeper because he's a really pivotal figure in all this. Now, Lloyd George is important for a number of reasons. He's a very unusual uh, politician. He is a really, really immensely talented politician. And he's obviously referred to as the man who won the war. So he has amazing kudos in, in England at this point in time. He's a liberal, but he's at the head of a coalition that are mainly made up of conservatives who were their pre-war enemies, so to speak, you know, on the other side of the British Parliament. So he's unusual in the sense that he's a prime minister with, with supporters, backbenchers, MPs, who are actually opposed to him. But they, they are sort of like they are bound to him by the fact that he has won the war. He's pulled Britain out of the, the terrible situation that it got into under Asquith. And um, essentially, he was the man who drove the victory at all costs. So he has an enormous reputation in 1918, at the end of 1918. And he's won this landslide election. that It was called the Hang the Kaiser election because essentially he went around 33 times. He said he promised to hang the Kaiser. Now, it was all... Luster. He was a. He's known as a demagogue. He was like a the ultimate democrat. He come from a fairly a fairly um, a humble beginning. He was a, an unusual prime minister, and he rose to the very top by his ability. So he's in charge of the British democracy, and Britain has just become a democracy. It's the first time it's a you know a majority democracy. So this has really big implications in this story that are not really appreciated uh, all the time. But the thing about him was he was an admirer of the Greeks and um, he'd been at Sunday school in Wales. He was a fundamentalist Protestant. So essentially he was like um, he, he had a very good classical education and the Greeks and the Jews, he had great affection for them. He saw them as great peoples of the, of the past, the Greeks from his classical education and the Jews from the Bible, which he'd read, you know, like in his boyhood days every day. So he was a, a fundamentalist. So he wanted to put them back to where they should be in history. Now, this is this is important to notice. And that's why he had such a great affection for them. He also he was a, a liberal. That's very important because he had the he was a Gladstonian liberal, a great supporter of, 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 of Gladstone. And he had a dislike of the unspeakable Turk. That was the phrase that the Gladstonian liberals often used. And he saw that the Turk as a much inferior sort of race than the Greek, who were a proud, great race of the past. The Turks were these sort of barbarians that had come from the steppes and, you know, the, the usual story, you know. So he had this viewpoint. And um, but the important thing about this, we have to remember this, is that he's supported by mainly conservative MPs. Now, the conservatives are known from the time of Disraeli, Benjamin Disraeli, as being uttering the famous phrase, the Turk is a gentleman, because they tended to see Turks as being a sort of like a gentlemanly race amongst a whole load of barbarians in the East, right? So they had a different viewpoint than Lloyd George. So he was sitting on top of these people who were sort of waiting with their knives out to get him at some point if he screwed up. That was basic to use an American expression. So this is a powder keg, you know, uh, here. Um, Lloyd George had a great regard for Venizelos. He called him the greatest Greek since Pericles. He didn't, hadn't much time for the Greeks 
since ancient history. But Venizelos was like, he was the man who was going to bring the Greeks back to everything, to, to their great standing. And in fact, he, he saw him as a bit like himself. He was like a really, you know, a vigorous, like self-made man. You know, he'd been a Cretan um, insurrectionary and stuff like that. So Lloyd George saw the same thing in, in Venizelos. So he really admired him. And um, but Venizelos, apart from Lloyd George, he seemed to have captivated most of the Allied leaders with his charm and his powers of persuasion. He was he promised the world to people and he was an extremely charismatic man. And of course, this is a, a very important thing to remember. And it leads to the disaster for the Greeks, essentially, this relationship between Lloyd George and Venizelos. You know. So can we have the next slide then? OK, so we have another famous person then. I think we've gone maybe one more. If we just go back one, I think. Uh, or have I got an extra one? Oh, wait a minute. Let's see. What's happened there? The Caucasus dimension. Oh, sorry. I, I think I have this one. Um, monkey spy. If I missed that one out, sorry. Anyway, uh, let's see now. I, just, I have another slide here I'm going to talk about. Maybe I've, I've got one called Grease the Perfect Cat's Paw. Is that there just after that one? Just see, could you check the next one, please? Just to see if that's, uh, and another one again? Uh, no, no, I, so go back again, go back. I must have an extra slide here, sorry about that. Um, go back, if we go back to the one, um, uh, yeah, we'll stay on, uh, or go back one more, go back one more. And one more again. Just one. Yeah, that's the one I want. That's the one. That's the one I seem to be missing. OK, so Greek, Greece, the perfect cat's paw. Hal Nicholson, he's a very famous diplomat from a really long diplomatic family. And he wrote, this is very important, this bit here. He wrote in a, in a document on British foreign policy. He wrote, geographically, the position of Greece was unique for our purpose, the British purpose. Politically, she was strong enough to save us the expense in peace and weak enough to be completely subservient in war. So that what this says is this, is that Greece was really perfect for Lloyd George and the British because it had some strength and it could save expense. Britain was bankrupt after the First World War. They'd, learnt, they'd lent massive amounts of money off the United States the Treasury was nearly empty in the end of 1916, the British Treasury. And essentially, that meant that when Britain finished the war, it was really in hock to the United States. It couldn't fight anymore. It couldn't it couldn't basically, you know, in get use its forces for further imperial purposes. It needed somebody else to do it. So Greece was perfect for that. It was strong enough to save us the expense of peace, but it was completely subservient in war. And the reason for that is quite simple, is that the Greeks could be cut down to size by the Royal Navy if they ever overstepped the mark. So in other words, if the Greeks walked into Istanbul, they could be destroyed in Athens, right? So the Royal Navy could bombard them. So the British had the, had the Greeks really by, by the throat. They knew what they, were, what they were useful for, for their purposes in Anatolia. They could save money for the British Treasury and save lives of British servicemen, but they also could be threatened any time they like. So they were the perfect um, cat's paw, as Harold Nicholson said. That's from a document in, uh, in British Foreign Policy series. So, you know, it's an important thing. So can we move on to the next slide? Thanks. And it should be time beyond Lloyd George and the Greeks. I think, well, maybe there's one missing over there. I'll do this one anyway, just in case you don't have it. I'll get on to the Caucasus dimension in a minute. Um, yeah, so it might be one back. It must be missing ones or something. But anyway, Arnold Toynbee is a famous historian. And he said this, he said, the British government cannot keep troops mobilized in the East to enforce its terms of peace upon Turkey. But Greece can provide the troops and enforce the terms with British diplomatic and naval backing. And she will be glad to do so if these terms include her own claims. If Greece makes these claims good through British backing, she will have to follow Britain's lead. Greece is a maritime power, a labyrinth of peninsulas and islands and territories 
that she wants in Anatolia are overseas. In short, if Turkey can be dominated by the land power of Greece, Greece can be dominated by the sea power of Great Britain. And so the British government can still carry out their war aims in the Middle East without spending British money or lives. And that puts the whole thing in, in perspective. The British could, could basically continue to use the Greeks as an instrument whereby they could get their aims pursued. You know, So the, the Greeks were perfect for the British. And that's why Lloyd George and Toynbee and everybody involved themselves in that. Um, OK, the monkey's bite. OK, so what happened? The monkey's bite. This is a famous thing that Winston Churchill said, that because King Alexander uh, inappropriately died um, by a monkey's bite, this brought Constantine back to Greece. And I'll get that to in, in a minute. But it's a very important uh, point um, that we're going to look at uh, later on uh, in, in 1920. Um, could you move on the slide, please? I think we've got the Caucasus next. I just want to talk about, about that briefly before we go into the, the final part, really. So next slide, please. Sorry. Oh, that's the one on, on um, I think I've got a slightly different order. That's OK. I've got the order. It's just the order's different. Um, OK, so I'm actually, yeah, I'm going to look at that there now. So what happens here is this. Um, there is a, a very important election takes place in Greece in 1919 and it's uh, 1920. And essentially what happens is that Venizelos, who has seemingly won the war, um, he fights an election against King Constantine, um, even though Constantine is not a cabinet, is not, is not a candidate in this election. So essentially he thinks to himself, if I fight against King, against King Constantine, I will win. Right. So he, he effectively fights against King Constantine in this election, even though it's against his opponents in the in, in Greece. And really what that amounts to is that if Constantine, win, if, the, if his opponents win, Constantine comes back and takes control uh, of, of the state. So that is actually what happens. Constantine, Venizelos loses the election really unexpectedly and the government invite back Constantine to, become, to, to return as king. Now, this has really big implications because Constantine is against what, what, what has happened. But at this point, the Greek army is landed in Smyrna. OK, and we'll get to that in a minute. And so Constantine has a dilemma. So he looks at the Greek military position and it seems to be pretty very good at this point. And um, so he decides to continue the adventure begun by Venizelos, OK? Uh, he sort of has a choice of retreating to the coast and defending Greek colonists, colonies from the Turks. Um, or his other choice is throwing everything at the Turks to finish them off, OK? So this is like 1920. Um, and so he has this big dilemma. So we're having to explain why Constantine continues to fight Venizelos's war when he's actually against it in the first place. But it's because of the position the Greeks have find themselves in. And um, we'll get to that now in a minute. So could you move on to the next slide? Thank you. Um, OK, so. As I said, you know, Professor um, Professor Erickson has explained all the military side, and I'm sure your viewers know about the military side of the of, of the War of Independence. But um, essentially, the Greeks have taken over Smyrna and they've expanded their lines outwards and then they've They've, they've gone further and further. And they've actually, you know, gone further than the British want them to go. And because the problem that they have essentially is this, that they can't just defend the territory that they uh, have desired. They, they, are, they are lured into a situation where they have to defeat the Turkish resistance that is developing in Anatolia around Ankara, for instance, right? So they, they're lured further and further in because... You know, the, the, the other option, which is just to defend the area around Smyrna and stick to that area, is really not an option uh, because of the fact, one, there is like, you know, they, they want more territory. But secondly, militarily, they, they, they realize that if Turkish resistance, if Turkish power develops, it'll come for them. It'll come for them sooner or later. So 
the obvious thing to do is to try and demoralize the Turks by basically defeating their army outside of Ankara where they have to have to fight. And that's I think that's what Professor Erickson was talking about last week. So they're lured into the, this situation where the Greeks lines are expanded and and basically they they, they, they come into the final, um, you know, uh, you know, battle at Sarkaya. And, uh, you know, that, that's a disaster, you know. But anyway, so it, the British are financing this Greek army, but it's thoroughly defeat, defeated. Um, and it's, you know, after being skillfully maneuvered into a position by Mustafa Kemal, in which the Greek lines are severely stretched. Now, the, the implications of this are that the conservative backbenchers in the coalition government, Lloyd George's government, they start to use the event to rein in the prime minister's military support for the Greeks. So they start saying, we're not going to support you. You're not, we're not going to give you any more money for the Greeks, right? And the two reasons why they give, they, they're able to do this is because, one, they use Constantine's return. They say Constantine was a German agent. He was against us. So we're not going to support Greece while Constantine rules it. So they use that as an excuse. Now, you know, this is completely... Um, nobody seems to talk about this in British history, about why this is suddenly, you know, a use as it, but it's obviously an excuse. It's not no more than that. Um, but the second thing is they realize the Turkish are becoming a power. They're obviously, the Turkish are not beaten. They're not down. They're actually going to reemerge. So they're actually saying, you know, there, there's a change in the, in the, in the, in the balance of power in, in Asia Minor. And essentially the Greeks are not going to be, the people that are going to enforce our settlement for us at Severus. So essentially, they start withdrawing their support and the Greeks go into a full retreat. And there's some sort of things there uh, that, I, that uh, you know, that ultimately what happens uh, with Smyrna. So they, you know, uh, that comes in later on anyway. But this was actually what it constitutes in geopolitical terms is a betrayal of the Greeks. So who were encouraged into the Great War with the, with the promises of territory, but they're left in the lurch when their army is halfway across Anatolia, you know, just after they failed to suppress the Turks. OK, so the next slide, please. Um, we'll look at this, this issue then. So who actually betrayed who? I mean, it seems to be quite, um, in some ways, clear that the British betrayed the Greeks. But it's an interesting thing because Churchill later writes that... Um, that actually it was the Greeks who portrayed the British, which is an interesting argument. But this is what he says in World Crisis. He says, it should be absurd to ask the British or French democracy to make sacrifices or efforts for a people whose real spirit was shown by their choice of such a man, Constantine. For the sake of Venizelos, much had to be endured, but for Constantine, less than nothing. So you can see here that Churchill's saying, you know, once they brought Constantine back, he was our enemy during the war. He, he maintained Greek neutrality. So we're going to drop him straight away. But to be honest, it's, it's really an excuse, you know. It was not Britain who betrayed Greece, but apparently the ungrateful Greeks who had betrayed England. The Turks were now the substance to take of account of in the region. So the British, are, you know, really changed their position very suddenly. And this really lets the Greeks down. And really what's happening is, Greek, is British state interest. They need to have sort of friends of some sort in the region. The Greeks are not powerful enough. They've been shown to be beaten. Uh, so, so basically, there's, a, there's a, a subtle change in British interests. And then they're, they're, they're moving towards making a settlement with, with Mustafa Kemal at this point. And it really, from there onwards, it's just a test of how much uh, Mustafa Kemal can take back of Anatolia. And that the British will then negotiate. And of course, we know the Shinak thing and everything like that. But anyway, um, you know, the result of this is that Greek is del Greece is deluged with a million homeless, penniless refugees who had nothing, uh, everything left everything in Asia. And during the next decade and a half, 19 changes of government in Greece take place and uh, three changes of regime. And the finance of the Greek government collapsed under the double strain of the cost of the settlement of the refugees and the world economic crisis resulting from the Great War. So Greece becomes bankrupt and has to suspend the services of our foreign loans. And really, has it ever recovered from this misadventure and this relationship with Britain? So the Greeks paid a really massive price 
for what for this uh, misadventure. That's all I could call it. Uh, but Churchill was actually, you know, intent on blaming the Greeks for what they did uh, by inviting Constantine back. But that is not the story, really. Essentially, it's a story of 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 Turkish, the Turks rejuvenating, resurging, resurgence, which essentially changes the balance of power. Now, that can never be written in uh, British uh, narratives uh, because, um, you know, and, and it, uh, the uh, British narrative also leaves uh, the whole Shanak crisis where Churchill tried to get the empire to fight the Turks, tried to get the New Zealanders, the Canadians, the Australians to fight, uh, but they wouldn't fight, you know, at the end of the day. They, they had enough of the war. That was it. So, you know, there, this is there's a sort of like a type of, you know, a narrative that spun around these events that is false. You know, even Churchill is doing it. You know, um, Churchill famously said when he was asked, you know, would history be kind to you? He said, I, I, it will because I'll write it myself. So this is exactly what he did, you know. Um, so Churchill did actually write the, the history and it's actually the accepted history now. So, so um, can we move on to the next slide, please? Uh, Toynbee was also very interesting about this. OK, so we should have a, a slide, Arnold Toynbee's verdict, because, yeah, so Arnold Toynbee is really interesting for Turks, so he should be, because obviously Toynbee is one of the men who construct the uh, the Armenian Blue Book, you know, the, the sort of Wellington House propaganda. Now, Toynbee, lesser known is what he writes after the war, um, because, you know, essentially he's saying that he was wrong. You know, he was a great historian. And he gave his services to a propaganda department and um, he essentially was wrong. Right. And he says this and uh, some of the stuff that Toynbee says is really cutting. And I, I'm going to read these. These are the last three quotes just to finish this off. He says, um, a game played with living pieces may be a cruel spectacle. And halfway through her own through halfway through half and half. Sorry. And half through her own fault. Greece has been the principal victim. The fault is only half hers, for at first she struggled hard not to be drawn into the rivalries between the powers, and the struggle cost her her internal unity. But instead of common sense and moderation prevailing, they were overborne by the, by the pressure of the Entente powers and the imperious personality of Mr. Venizelos. And Greece, more than ever divided at home, was pushed into foreign policy of reckless aggrandizement, towards which the blind herd instinct up under the surface of her politics was all the time imper impelling her. At last, fatally at war within herself, and at the same time fatally united for war against a neighboring nation, she was brought to a point from which she could neither reach internal or external peace, nor retreat without the loss or even disaster. The world has sympathized with the personal tragedy of Mr. Venezelos. There is a greater pathos in the national tragedy of his country. So, you know, Toynbee, who did support the Greeks and wanted to arm them and wanted to, 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 to impose the Treaty of Severus on the Turks, he suddenly decided at the end of the war that the Greeks were stupid to, to, to actually accept Britain's um, help and, and, and Britain's uh, uh, being an instrument of Britain. You know, how, um, I don't know, how, what, how, do you, how, do you, how do you reconcile this with morality? I don't know. Uh, these are really uh, moral liberals, but he's basically saying, yes, we wanted you to do all these things, but you're stupid to do them for us, you know? And it's your tragedy because you, you were, you know, foolish enough to be so, so, um, so, um, wanting territory of the Turkish territory. How are you so stupid to be like this? This is what we worked on this. But how are you so stupid to be to, to be conned by us? You know, I, I mean, it's an incredible quote. You won't see that in any history books. And if you want to move on to the next slide, I think it's the second last. It's just another thing that Toynbee said. Um, yeah, he said that Mr. Venezelos grasped at such excessive territorial prizes he failed to secure the greater price of peace. Being a statesman of great force and a great charm of character, he has been able to give ample effect to his policy. And when it has been mistaken, his country has therefore suffered its consequences to the full. 
neutrality was more prudent, more wise for Greece and more dignified than the purchase of territory by intervention. And it makes for the general betterment of international relations if small states always and everywhere keep as clear as possible of the rivalries between great powers. You know, if only the British had said that to the Greeks in 1914 and 1915 and 1916, instead of twisting their arms and forcing them into the war. But here we suddenly get a complete verdict from the horse's mouth, so to speak, that the whole thing was disastrous for the Greeks. And they would have been much wise to have supported the king to the death, which they couldn't have done because the British basically maneuver them into the war. But, you know, it's it's tragic to read that. And um, I sort of, you know, reading a lot of this stuff, I, I have a sympathy for the Greeks in what they suffered, but I, I still find it hard to understand why the Greeks don't write about this. You know, I, I find this hard. I don't know, I haven't read stuff in Greece, Greeks, in, in, in Greek, but I, I don't know if, there, if this, this, this emerges at all. But, it, you know, it seems to be the British are basically telling us the truth after the war and Toynbee's telling us the absolute truth. So there's just one more slide, I think. Oh, no, there's two more slides, sorry. Um, yeah, there's this slide here I want to just, uh, before I talk about the corpses, but this, uh, just to roll the corks, but this last one, that's great. Great, yeah. I think I have a slightly different order here. This is a really interesting quote I came across and it says, it, I, I titled it, Greek Pawns Created the Turkish Queen. And it's, re it's very, very, uh, incisive this and this is what Toynbee says he says on the international chessboard such pieces like Greece make excellent pawns and the western diplomacists have not neglected them the port this pawn playing in like in chess however has not been so odiously cold and disingenuous as an analysis makes it appear the trap in which the victims have been caught in order to be exploited was not so cunningly hidden. They rushed into it with their eyes open because they could not resist the bait. You know, they couldn't resist the territory in Anatolia. There's been less conspiracy about it and more sport. It's like being a sport. They, the Greeks, were too weak to perform the role marked out for them, however great the bribe we gave them. They could not struggle onto the eighth square and turn into queens. On the contrary, they have displayed an exasperating faculty of making queens out of the opposing pawns. So what he was saying is the Greeks helped to make the Turks the sort of queen of the area, right, by by basically trying to be that themselves. Um, and, and I thought that was very interesting, you know. And of course, you might say, well, why aren't the Turks the king? Because Britain's the king. But Britain's the king not for very long, you know. <laughs> It's the king of the world at that point, but it's not uh, the king for too long after that. And and that's I think that's a fitting end. And it shows you the entire um, the entire um, um, sort of uh, uh, situation uh, in a nutshell. Now, there was one other slide I had there and I, I've left it. out. It's about the, the, the just the one thing I, I can talk about it without the slide. It's about the Caucasus. And what's very interesting about the Caucasus is this, that things might have been extremely diff different if Lloyd George had not got his way. Because I came across when I was writing the book about the Caucasus, a very interesting material about Churchill. And Churchill was really Lloyd George's main opponent within the British government. Uh, and Churchill had a different idea. And I think this is a thing that I, I, I very rarely see in any histories. Churchill was an old aristocrat and he, he, he wanted a British foreign policy like before 1914. In other words, the old British foreign policy was this. Essentially, it was when a war is over, you change your alliances. You don't care about what you said because the aristocracy, they ran the wars and they decided on the peace. Like, it was, not like in um, the Treaty of Vienna in 1815, for instance, where Britain made peace with uh, France and the French actually took part in the Congress of Vienna, right, the, the, the losers. But what happened in 1918 was a democratic peace. And because there was such morality had been involved in it and a democratic war in which big armies had been raised, they couldn't do this. The British foreign policy couldn't be like the old policy that was so successful. It had to reflect 
a sort of, um, you know, uh, anger and morality and things like this. So they couldn't settle the peace well. Now, what Churchill wanted to do after the war finished in 1918, he wanted to make peace with the Germans and the Turks immediately. And he wanted to give them very generous pieces. You know, he, they'd been defeated, but he wanted to make a peace immediately. And the reason why, because he looked at what was happening in the East and he said, the big threat now is the Bolsheviks. And the point is to keep the Bolsheviks out of the Caucasus and to uh, and basically to defeat them, actually to destroy them. So he wanted to make a very generous peace with uh, with Istanbul. And he wanted to make a very generous peace with the Germans. So basically, he wanted he didn't want anything to do with the Greeks. And he told Lloyd George he was a fool using the Greeks because the Greeks would would basically turn the Turks westward. And instead of what Churchill wanted to do, actually, was to engage the Turks in a war on the Bolsheviks. And basically what that might have happened in that situation would have been if, if he'd have managed to accomplish it. And I think there was a lot of people in Turkey that were that would have been willing to to sort of like, you know, uh, basically, you know, involve themselves in a, a peace with with Britain, and and basically that would have driven Turkey eastward into Azerbaijan, and basically it would have meant that the Turks would have would have driven into uh, uh, and defended Baku and that line, and and basically behind the White Russians. Um, so, you know, this was a, a what if uh, of history uh, that Churchill was basically defeated politically by by Lloyd George. And Lloyd George's policy prevailed, and that meant using the Greeks, and that led to the alliance between Mustafa Kemal and the Bolsheviks, because it was an alliance of convenience. The Turks had to had to secure their rear, and they had to defeat the Armenians there, and basically, you know, obviously get arms and get finance from the, from the, from the Bolsheviks. But that, you know, essentially that completely changed history, because uh, you know, if, if Churchill's policy had prevailed, there might have been a very different outcome in the whole region. Um, I don't know what would have happened. We, we can't really tell. But essentially, Lloyd George's use of the Greeks led to what happened and led actually to, uh, in the Caucasus, Azerbaijan, Georgia and Armenia falling, falling <coughs> to the Bolsheviks. So history could have changed if, if, Lloyd, if Lloyd George hadn't been the prime minister. And of course, the final story of this is that Lloyd George's government falls in 1922 as a result of the Shanak crisis. You know, this is the thing that enables the Tory backbenchers to put the knives into Lloyd George and get rid of him one, one, once and for all. They're not happy with his policy in Ireland as well. But essentially, you know, Lloyd George and the great coalition government is actually to, is brought down by the Turkish resistance. And essentially, it changes the whole course of British politics because uh, you then have a series of weak British governments um, you know, uh, 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 leading up to the Second World War. But the what Churchill called the government of the first 11 was gone. The Lord Curzons, the Churchills, the um, Arthur Balfour's, Lloyd George, all those people fell from power, Lord Birkenhead, the whole lot of them. And you had a back to British party politics, uh, you know. So this, this whole thing had great implications in Britain and the world. And it was the first sign, I think, of the decline in British power both uh, the failure to defeat the Bolsheviks uh, in the civil war and the failure to defeat Tur Turkey or failure to impose the Treaty of Severus and having it overturned, having to conclude the Treaty of Lausanne, which was obviously much more advantageous for Turkey. Um, this was the first sign of the decline of the British Empire, you know, uh, and it, it's not written about in history because of that, because the British can't, won't write that in their, in their own history. Um, you know, that this whole period is just forgotten about. And that's why the Greeks have forgotten about it. And this whole thing is forgotten about. It, and it's why a forgotten aspect of, of the First World War. So that's basically it, if you have any questions. Yes. Excellent, excellent. Uh, uh, we can go for hours. It's amazing. Uh, we need to promote this uh, lecture and, uh, and these facts as much as we can. One last question. We have taken too much of your time. No Do you see a parallel of the events of today with the events of 100 years ago? Yeah, I mean, you know, Afghanistan, you know, the, these parallels just keep cropping up, really. You know, um, you have, uh, I think, you know, uh, if you look at 
I mean, personally, you know, you asked me about what's my opinion of Joe Biden's um, withdrawal. And I've been a critic of Joe Biden's um, policy in the sense of, uh, you know, his uh, genocide uh, recognition. Right. But I think he was entirely right about Afghanistan. Um, I think it was a, 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 you know, to be honest, after 9-11, we could have expected the, the Americans to, to, you know, to bring, you know, to bring massive military power against Afghanistan. But after that, I mean, it went into a nation building type, um, uh, you know, adventure in which um, they couldn't, you know, they couldn't do it. It was an impossible task, essentially. Uh, but you have a whole industry of people a bit, a bit like the Lloyd Georges. They're the humanitarian interventionists. You know, they are liberals and they want to sort of like reconstruct the world in, in a more civilized form, i.e. like America. But you can't you can't uh, batter civilization, uh, you know, civilizations and peoples into a different, uh, um, you know, a, a different thing. Uh, and of course, it's just caused a, a longer enduring nightmare for Afghanistan. So you have those elements and you have, um, you know, you can see the collapse of the Afghan forces the minute that the support was withdrawn. Same the Greeks, uh, you know, the same. They put up greater resistance, the Greeks. But, you know, essentially they, they collapsed as well once they were no longer a cat's paw um, for Britain. So there, there is great parallels. And, you know, the, I mean, the real, uh, at, at the end of the day, these things get sorted out by power politics and by the, the event the actual realities of power on the ground. In Afghanistan, the only substantial power now are the Taliban and people that are in those, those ranks. So essentially, you know, Afghanistan as a state can only be, um, you know, uh, much as we would dislike the Taliban, we wouldn't want to be ruled by the ta Taliban under any circumstances ourselves. But, you know, there is no alternative because the other alternatives were destroyed, you know, along the way. There was possibly part times when Najibullah was, was president and things like that, or even in the 1960s or whatever. But, you know, it became a, a battlefield of the great powers. And, uh, you know, at the end of the day, now the only possible development is by you know, maybe assistance and, and really, you know, peace and stability in the country and, and, and the, the keeping out of terrorists, obviously. Uh, but, you know, uh, the nation building thing is, was, is Biden was right to call it off, I think. You know, I can't. I, I mean, lots of people disagree with me with that, but I, he was right to call it off. And, um, you know, there was no, it was just more of the same if he didn't. You know, so there is great parallels between this period of history uh, in some ways, it's America doing making the same mistakes as Britain, although America is not the uh, the imperialist power Britain was. It's it's not successful, for one thing. Um, it doesn't have the instincts of imperialism that Britain did. Um, and it hasn't America has not been a very good imperialist power, essentially. Um, you know, it, it, it's it's great achievements in the world, I think, have been things like, you know, the Marshall Plan and stuff like that, where it's actually assisted uh, areas to develop, and but, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in situations. But in other areas, it's it's failed because it's maybe hasn't got the had, hasn't got the insights Britain had through ruling peoples of the past, you know, in a, a very uh, a long over a long period of time, like the Indian Empire. Um, so. But there is great parallels. You're right entirely, Oya, you know. Yeah. Well, well, thank you. Thank you. I think Biden did it uh, right. I, it is commendable. And the mess that it produced in the evacuation was really the military was supposed to handle it. Uh, yeah. So Biden didn't go into all the uh, minute details. It's the military's position, leaving the base Overnight, uh, I mean, they messed it up pretty, uh, pretty bad. Anyway, thank you so much, and nope. uh, we'll, uh, uh, distribute the article with the program with yes. your with the link. And it is really a pleasure to have you, and thank you. And hopefully, we'll see you towards the end of the year. Uh, to talk about Dalek Karabakh, as we call it in Turkish. Thank you again. Thank you no again. Problem. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. A pleasure. It's really an eye opener. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Joy.